if we had all the notes, I'll start off talking about the endocrine system, what it does. Remember we talked about homeostasis a while back? Yes, and that sir. homeostasis in the body's attempt to maintain equilibrium. Right? Yes, yes. Sir. yes, sir. And one of the things that does that uh, helps with this are hormones. So you have to understand what a hormone is. A hormone is a chemical message. Remember, if we want something to occur in another part of the body, and we want it to happen very, very quickly, we send the message electrically down a nerve. And that message gets there super fast. Okay. However, the effect doesn't last super long, typically. So what we want to do is we want to have, in some cases, the effect lasts longer. So in that case, we're not going to send it in the send that message in the form of an electrical signal and send it in the form of a chemical signal. So we're going to put this chemical signal into the blood. And that makes sense because where does the blood go? Everywhere. Everywhere. So without regard to what organ or what part of the body we want to send this message to, blood goes everywhere. So we'll just put it in the blood eventually we get to where we want it to go. So we have some other part of the body that we want to do something. We want that effect to last somewhat longer. Uh, so our body's going to have to send a message from point A to point B. However, it's not quite that simple. Let's get it. First of all, we have an organ or a gland that's going to secrete a hormone. And it will secrete a hormone, one of two main types of hormones. The hormone is often described or presented as an arrow. So we send this hormone from one organ or gland to another. Now, hormones can act in one of two main ways. It can be a stimulatory hormone. That's a plus sign in a circle. It didn't come out quite well one to two. There we go. And a stimulatory hormone is going to tell another organ or gland to do something. Just like if you're coming home from grocery shopping, food shopping, and you have your hands full of groceries, and your significant other is standing at the door, with the door open, and you tell your significant other, I've got all the groceries, shut the door. That's a direction for that person to do something. So a stimulatory hormone is going to be a hormone that is released to tell another organ or gland to do something. Another type, or another way that a hormone can act is what we call an inhibitory hormone. An inhibitory hormone is going to tell another organ or gland specifically not to do something. It's a message saying don't do something. So as you come home with your arms full of groceries and there's still more in the car and you're significant others by the door, you can tell them, I have more groceries, do not shut the door. You're specifically telling them not to do something. What is that called? Inhibitory hormone. Where, where is, is that only in like not yet. somewhere? Okay. It's in there somewhere, just not yet. Um, so we're going to make it easy for now. We'll just stick with what we call stimulatory hormone. What was that circle? It just was a zero. Oh, that's just another organ or gland. Because this is the way the body works. Listen, this with hormones. It's not as simple as the body says, I want that way down there to do something, so I'm going to send a signal to the chemical signal. In fact, it's not as easy as this organ is sending a hormone to this one. It is this organ sends a hormone to this organ or gland that is going to send a hormone to another organ or gland to do, tell it to do something. But it's still not that easy because then this organ or gland is going to send a hormone to eventually what we call the target organ to tell it to do whatever the body wants it to do. 
So this is the chain reaction that hormones uh, act. So the body says, eventually I want my red star to do something. So this says, all right, I'll send a message to the blue circle. Blue circle will send the message to the green triangle. Green triangle will send his message to the red star and will do something. And all shapes are considered um, organs or glands. Okay. But now, how do we know that the red star actually got the message? Well, because he will send a message back. He'll send a message back to the green star that says, I got your message. Stop sending me the message. I'm doing what you want me to do. Shut up. Is that another hormonal message? Yep. That's another message. In some cases, it might send a message this way. So the arrows would be the hormone. The, arrow, the hormone is represented by an arrow, yes. So the star now says, I got the message. Stop sending your message to the green triangle so he'll stop sending the message to me. Sometimes, in some cases, it'll send the message all the way back here. That'll say, I got the message. Stop sending your message to the blue circle so he'll stop sending the message to the green triangle so he'll stop sending the message to me. In some cases, this is, this is what's called negative feedback. The, the same way your thermostat works in your house. You set the temperature uh, for 70 degrees, and the temperature in the room drops below 70. The thermostat realizes that and sends a message to the furnace says, we want the heat to come up. It's taught it to do the opposite. In some cases, this organ might send a message that says, I got your message, green star, or green, sorry, green triangle. Keep sending more. We call that feed forward or positive feedback. I got the message, and I'll give you an example of that later on. But I got the message, give me more. It was a good message. So, this is why the endocrine system gets confusing for people. Because if a person comes in to the doctor's office and they say, I have a problem, my red star is not doing what my red star is supposed to do. Well, we're going to have to test the red star and make sure the red star is okay. But then we're also going to have to test these hormones to see if they're working like they're supposed to. Because maybe this hormone is wrong. If this hormone is wrong, then it's never going to tell this green triangle to do the right thing, which means it's never going to give the right message to the red star. Or maybe one of these messages is constantly on, saying, constantly sending back, saying, I got your message, stop sending it. I got your message, stop sending it. But it really didn't get the message, so it's not actually doing anything. Or, if that's not confusing enough, which I'm sure it's getting there, remember, these hormones that are acting in this pathway might also act in another pathway to tell another organ to do something. So even though the message is going this way to tell the red star something, this hormone might also act in some other pathway to tell another organ or gland to do something. Well, that's not a bad thing, it's just a signal. Yes, but it also might act as an inhibitory hormone and even a different pathway to tell something else, we're going to kill this, to tell something else, to not do something specifically. So the point is, if we mess with these hormones or if there's a problem with these hormones, not only will it change this pathway, it could also change this pathway, it could also change this pathway. In other words, it could also change other things in the body, make other things do what they're not supposed to do or not do what they're supposed to do. This is why people don't like the endocrine system. Okay, so. but, but the reality is it makes it kind of easy because these are chemical messages. And where are the chemical messages found? In the brain? No. Yeah. Chemical messages found in the pancreas? The chemical messages are found in the blood. Found in the blood. Remember I said it puts it in the blood? All of these hormones are in the blood. They're chemical messages. So all we gotta do is take the patient's blood. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. So we can get a lot of information from blood. That's why we do that. Okay. Oh. That's okay. I got it.
The endocrine system is the body's attempt to maintain, well, help to maintain equilibrium. It does this through the release of hormones in the blood, and here I have a hormone as a chemical message sent through the blood to act on distant target tissues. These messages tend to have a longer effect than the electrical messages that we send down to the nerves. These hormones act in a chain reaction to affect target organs, blah, 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 blah. Uh, then there are these checkpoints that send messages back. The endocrine system includes the hypothalamus, which is in the diencephalon of the brain. The pituitary gland, which is actually two separate glands. The thyroid gland, the parathyroid glands, the thymus, the hypothalamus, which is up here in the brain, the pituitary gland, which is up there, uh, just right in front, the thyroid, which is here, the parathyroids that are here, the thymus that is here, the pancreas, which is here, the adrenal glands, which are here, here, the ovaries, which are here, the testes, which are here. And I did it on Ben because I want you to realize how this system is sort of scattered throughout the body. That's a lot different than like the respiratory system where we have the lungs here and the airway goes in and out. This yeah, way. Like the adrenal system, very compact. Kidneys are here, ureters, your, uh, ureters, bladder, urethra. It's all nice and compact. This is different because everything's sort of spread out. Just a moment. I know you had a question earlier. Okay. Yes. The, there's three glands that are in your brain. Well, parts of the brain that act as endocrine mm, but parts of, of the brain that act as uh, endocrine glands and that they secrete hormones. And in the diencephalon, the central part of the brain, the hypothalamus is a major component of that. The pituitary gland, which again is two separate glands, and the pineal gland. Which is sort of more towards the back. More towards the back of the diet cycle. You don't have that one. I know. Okay. So I didn't mention it the first time. Okay, so let's talk about the hypothalamus to start. The hypothalamus located in the brain, in the diet cephalon specifically. Not surprisingly, it is located just below the Thalamus, and that should make sense. It's the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus uh, has a, plays a big part in the central nervous system. Let's label this. Uh, as part of the endocrine system, the hypothalamus creates a lot of hormones. Uh, sort of like the place that starts that chain reaction, but there's two that I, two that I want you to know about. The two hormones of the hypothalamus production that I want you to know about are going to be antidiuretic hormone, ADH, and oxytocin. Because the hypothalamus, hypothalamus makes these, but it does not release those two into the blood. Those two get moved, actually, to the posterior pituitary gland. We'll call this the post pit. Posterior pituitary gland. Of course, if there's a posterior pituitary gland, you know there's going to be an anterior pituitary gland, one in the front. We'll call that the ant pit. Again, it's so often referred to as the master gland, the pituitary gland, it does so many different things. Um, but it's two separate glands that just sort of grew next to each other. Two separate embryologic origins. Sure. They started off from two different places. So that's the anterior and the posterior and anterior. Anterior. Yes. Notice I have here, these hormones are produced in the hypothalamus, but then stored in the posterior pituitary gland. So they're moved down this little bridge is stuck, and they're stored in the posterior pituitary gland, which means that they're released from the posterior pituitary gland. They're stored and then released from the posterior pituitary gland. The 
The pituitary gland, often called the master gland, is located in this little sort of bone, this little cutout, this little dish. Remember the sphenoid bone, the one that goes from one side of the cranium to the other? The sphenoid bone looks like a butterfly. Well, there's a little cutout in there called the cellotercicum. That's where the pituitary gland sits. Um, the pituitary gland is made up of these two parts, the adenohypophysis and the neurohypophysis. Notice those terms I have in italicies. Uh, that is because that's more for the paramedic students. You don't need to know that. We can just call them the anterior and posterior pituitary gland. One's towards the front, one's towards the back. So let's look at some of these anterior pituitary gland hormones, starting with the thyroid stimulating hormone, TSA. The thyroid stimulating hormone is going to cause the thyroid gland to release more hormones, not surprisingly, uh, the trigothyroid and the thyroxine, T3 and T4. Um, yeah, we'll get into more of that later on. The next two are FSH and LH, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Volatile stimulating hormone stimulates the ovaries uh, to produce the egg and secrete estrogen, estradiol, which we have estrogen. In males, it causes the seminiferous tubules to produce sperm in the testes. Luteinizing hormone is what's going to cause ovulation. It's going to cause release of the egg. Uh, it's also going to cause, in men, uh, the production of testosterone from the interstitial cells. You'll notice right here at the bottom of this page, I have a sentence in bold print. FSH and LH together are referred to as the gonadotropins. In other words, hormones of the gonads. I've bold printed it, I've underlined it, I've centered it in the page, indicating that it is of utmost importance. <laughs> Don't need the picture. Hmm. <laughs> I can't see his bottom of my eyes. Move up. When the printer starts working, he'll give us all the notes, the backup notes. What kind of monster do you think I am? The biggest. <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> Go ahead and try to read about these in the textbook. If you see in the textbook, well, again, I'm giving you the highlights. So they're going to include a lot more of the different hormones, especially the releasing hormones, and they're going to go into a little more detail. So this will be really tough to try and learn on your own. Uh, the next hormone from the anterior pituitary gland is prolactin. So these are all in the anterior. These are all coming from the anterior pituitary gland. Prolactin is what is going to cause um, the breast maturation in the young female, and it's also going to cause the production of milk during the pregnancy. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. Adrenocorticotropic hormone. So you said we got we get a paper just like this. Yes. All right. Yes. Relax, man. Jeez. This is too tight. This is our class. We gotta be uptight. We ain't got it in front of our face. We can't see that screen. Yep. There's a seat right here. Move up. Move up. I, I don't understand. I can't see it because I'm sitting too far back. Okay. I, I don't know how I can help you. Continue. I will. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. I appreciate it. That's awesome. All right. The adrenocorticotropic hormone causes the release of, uh, well, these hormones from the adrenal glands. <laughs> we'll see. That one too. So we'll see that one a little bit. The next one is called growth hormone. It's called what? <laughs> <laughs> it's 
so anterior pituitary, lots of hormones. Yep, because we're still going. Yeah. Growth hormone is going to cause growth. Mm -hmm. Cool. Really? Wow. Yeah. It will it will cause any cell that is capable of growing to grow. Oh. Now, it doesn't do it directly. It acts on liver, which causes another hormone to be released, which will cause any cell capable of growing to grow. But we're not going to worry about that. As long as you realize that eventually, growth hormone will cause any cell capable of growing to grow. You don't need to know the intermediate step. Then now we're the next step. Uh, notice I've included here the growth periods. 0 to 2, 4 to 7, and puberty. That's when people grow the most. 0 to 2, 4 to 7, and puberty. Okay, the last one here. Melanocyte stimulating hormone. Now, in men, uh, there's some controversy as to what it does. Uh, it goes in the book, but the book goes, sorry, the book goes into it a little bit, but I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to worry more about what it does in women. Uh, Melanocyte stimulating hormone is what's going to cause that mask of pregnancy to occur on her face when she's pregnant. Oh, the swelling sensation? That's the last one. It's, hyper, no, it's hyperpigmentation. Uh, it, also oh, yeah, that like yeah. ni it also causes that linea nigra. Oh, yeah. The dark the line. line. Oh, okay. Oh, that's not how long the baby wants to Oh, no, girl, you tripping. You ain't gonna make you you're, you're you're heck no. The dark line, where? I'm sorry. <laughs> how long is, that, is that a baby measurement line? What? Oh, my oh, God. Yes. What, what line? Yeah, it's a little different. The dark crazy. line that goes back to the abdomen. I think that's from the skin stretching. Yeah, that's fine. No, the skin stretching. We already had one. It's light. It's all that. What does it do again? What's it for? Yeah, what is it again? It's a hormone. It's a hormone. Melanocyte, melanocyte stimulating. Oh, okay. That, that dark line is a hormone. No, the dark line is caused by it's the hormone. It's caused by yeah. it. Oh, okay. It's not it's caused by it. Listen, listen, just a moment. It's called the melanocyte been. stimulating hormone. What's a melanocyte? Uh, so. That makes what? Melanocyte. Which is what? Dark hormone. Well, which is pigment. Pigment. pigment it's the dark pigment. It's the cells that make dark pigment. So here's a hormone that's stimulating the cells that make dark pigment, which is why dark pigment occurs. On that one line. On that one that's line. That's what I'm saying, on the one line. It's not a Wouldn't it be just dark? I don't know. Okay, that's weird. Like, nice. <laughs> it is weird. That was so weird. It is weird. That's why I included it. Oh. That's all just from the anterior pituitary gland. Thyroid stimulating hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, prolactin, adrenocorticotropic hormone, growth hormone, and melanocyte stimulating hormone. Uh, okay. The posterior pituitary hormones. The two here we're going to discuss are the two that were actually created in the hypothalamus, and they are, of course, ADH and our friend, our good friend, oxytocin. I'm not saying oxytocin. No, oxytocin. <laughs> Don't think it. I know you. Of course you. Oxytocin. Oxytocin. It's the same letters, though, right? Close. It's our funny. good friend, oxytocin. We love our oxytocin. Oxytocin is our best friend. You are going to learn a lot about oxytocin. You are going to realize how important oxytocin is. You're going to find out all the wonderful things to appreciate about oxytocin right after the break. So we are going to... I'm ready. Are you? Oh, man. <laughs> no. That's crazy. What are we talking about? Well, exactly. We stop with oxytocin. Uh, and the antidiuretic hormone. All right. Okay, have you ever heard of diuretic drugs? Yes. No, no it's actually. Okay. Okay. What do diuretic drugs do? Is that one of They make you pee. Oh. The water pill, hydrochlorothiazide, GTC is an example of a diuretic. Makes you pee. People who have high blood pressure, <laughs> oh, okay. because we make them pee out some of that water. Mm, 
people who have uh, problems with their heart pumping around blood well, which is why they end up with swelling in their feet and ankles. So if we make them pee out more water, then their blood becomes an area of high solute concentration, which means water is going to move from the tissue back into the blood again, so it gets rid of the swelling. So, diuretic drugs, they make the pee, so you pee out more water. But here is the antidiuretic hormone. Now, why would we want this? Why would we want a hormone that stopped us from peeing out too much water? Remember, when you think of the swimming pool, and the swimming pool has a filter, and the water leaves the swimming pool, goes through the filter, then sticks and leaves and dirt gets trapped, and the water returns back into the swimming pool cleaner than it was before. What would happen if the water did, or most of the water, what would happen if the water did not return back to the swimming pool? It would just keep going to drain. You have to continue just having water coming into the pool, because otherwise you never have water coming back in, the water would be empty. The pool will be empty. So when your blood is being filtered by your kidneys, you actually lose a lot of water in the process. And then most of that water is water that we need. We want it back into the system. So the body brings it back into the system with the help of the antidiuretic hormone. It helps bring back about 95% of that water that you would have lost, which is good. I mean, there's still a lot of water in urine but it would be a lot worse. Now, the antidiuretic hormone, ADH, stops the patient from peeing out too much. Water. Okay, so what is going to happen then if we block the antidiuretic hormone? If the antidiuretic hormone stops the patient from peeing out too much water, what's going to happen if we block the antidiuretic hormone? You're going to start peeing again? Patient's going to pee out too much water. We're going to stop, we're stopping the patient from peeing out too much water so the patient will pee out too much water. There's two things that you will need to know about eventually that block the antidiuretic hormone. One of those things is caffeine. The other thing is ethanol. Alcohol. I don't mean like rubbing alcohol. I mean like the alcohol that you drink. The alcohol that you drink. The alcohol that a patient drinks. <laughs> so that stops it? That is something that blocks the antidiuretic hormone which is going to cause the patient to pee out a lot more water. Uh -huh. Which means the patient will become dehydrated. I have a question. Yes. Remember I drank them in the summer and I walked so long and I felt like so swollen. Um, it's from drinking the alcohol. Wait, you yeah. drank it and you went walking? Yeah, like on the beach and stuff, but uh, I went to a concert. I don't know if that's from the drinking or, like or from the out walking shape. or from the out of shape or from the sun. So they get swollen like sooner. Yes, I would I would probably say as well not from the alcohol, but I would say because if it only happened when you were walking on the beach, yeah, it's like it didn't happen other times when you drank alcohol, then I would say it's probably not from the alcohol. It's probably from something else. We just have to narrow that down. Uh, the dehydration is one of the things that leads to the hangover, by the way. Thanks, well, then, yeah, yep. that's why you need to drink your water while you're taking shots. This is why we tell people if you're drinking those shots, you have to drink some water with them because you're going to lose a lot of water. Um, this is also why there's a big business now where uh, if you're in a place like Las Vegas, if there are doctors who specialize in the hangover fixes. They will send people to your room with an IV of fluids with some vitamins in it. We used to call it a banana bag. Uh, IV fluid or some potassium. It'll knock a hangover out and it never happened. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm suggesting it. people drink to excess and get hung over. Because <laughs> they want you to spend some more money. Can't get right up with 
It can, because you lose a lot of fluids, you lose electrolytes. Okay. So it can, but the reality is, um, you don't need that much of it to know that it's probably better to do a 50-50 mix. Okay. Like well, catering, half water, half catering. Okay. And Pedialyte. Um, Pedialyte's the same thing. What do you use? Like baby. What do they do? When you go to the hospital, they give you Gatorade and Pedialyte mixed in there. I don't drink juice. Pedialyte for adults and men. Yeah, they got it. It's called Gatorade. No, it's actually called Pedialyte. It's called Gatorade. It's Gatorade. What determines the length of time before your hangover hits? Uh, that's a good question because it certainly isn't noticed while the person is still drinking. Well. The re one of the main reasons I don't drink is because every time that I have, I've experienced hangover like symptoms that same night. So yeah, I'm just like, oh, it, 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 well, so it takes a couple through. of hours. So it only takes a couple of hours. Yeah. But again, it depends on the person. Depends on how much they drink. Yeah, they can be mad and how they drink. That's that's how hangover. Yeah, you just part of the volume is is the key. So because uh, people often think, well, if you mix alcohols, you're going to get drunker. No, uh, uh, an ounce of alcohol is found in about a bottle of beer. One bottle of beer has about one ounce of alcohol, which is about the same as a glass of wine, about one ounce of alcohol, which is the same as a shot of whiskey. It's about one ounce of alcohol. It doesn't make a person more drunk if they drink a shot and a beer as compared to drinking two beers. The only difference is they get that one ounce of alcohol quicker in the shot than they do in drinking the whole beer, so it takes more time to drink the whole beer, so your body has time to metabolize some of the alcohol. And if you sit down and you stand up, it really gets you. How about How about people who regularly use alcohol, and um, how do you explain the the, um, the tolerance build build up? I guess. Well, remember. Um, when we're talking about medications or drugs, those are acting on a particular part of the brain. Well, particularly part of the neuron. Well, specifically the synapse. Remember I said everything alters the amount of neurotransmitter that's released or um, the number of receptors that are there or how sensitive those receptors are to the neurotransmitter. So it works on that area, in that synapse, specific, mostly on the receptors. So that if a person wants to get that same feeling over time, those receptors require more and more neurotransmitter to, in order to activate them. And could that... And, and there's also, um, you know, every... I think, if you're not aware right now, most people are aware that the liver is the site where um, alcohol is broken down. Mm -hmm. So... There's an enzyme in the liver that uh, breaks it down. This is, again, why I talk about volume over time. If you take a whole lot at once, well, then it's not all going to get broken down at once because those enzymes are getting used up. Uh, but if you're sipping and sipping and sipping a beer, well, then it's taking longer for that alcohol part, the alcohol portion of it, uh, to actually get into the system to get to the liver so the enzymes can take their time breaking it down. So, where I was going to this, <laughs> somewhere important. Um, so it also depends on the amount of uh, enzymes that their liver is working on. Some people, some races, uh, genetically have less of that enzyme available, which means they're more prone to getting drunk faster. Mm -hmm. Like the Irish are not. <laughs> um, is that the same explanation as to why they wouldn't get hangovers? Because their their body's used to it. And the person with tolerance. Yeah. Well, they still do get hangovers, um, but the difference is they get more used to the hangovers. Oh, uh, that's true. And then they often treat the hangovers with more alcohol. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, By the way, there's so a there's a secondary mechanism that all of our cells have that breaks down alcohol. That kicks in more so in those chronic alcoholics, which mm -hmm. also affects the the, uh, the tolerance. My next question would be like, um, so if alcohol is like poison, um, you're saying it goes through our liver for the liver to break it down, but why do we not just immediately expel it? Why, like, is it being stored in our in our fat cells, and that's why 
we feel drunk. It's not, not stored in the fat cell. Or you know? it's like just, it's, it's stored it's somewhere. It's circulating and, and hitting those neurons in the brain. Oh, it circulates so it's, neurons it's, in the it's brain. It's circulating like this, okay? A lot of those alcohol molecules floating through the blood, hitting those neurons. Well, as the blood gets to the liver, the enzymes start breaking down some of that alcohol. So there's less and less of it. What That's are they breaking good. down? That's like stuff, stuff that we can use for an alcohol? No, we just break it down. Oh, okay. We, we, Into we, each it individual. Just, it just, yeah, it just gets um, destroyed, put it that way. Okay. But still, there's this much in the brain. Yeah. So as it continues to circulate, circulate through the body, or that enzyme gets activated, it's causing that alcohol to get broken down. So over time, we have less and less of that alcohol circulating through the system, which means less and less of it's hitting the brain, which means less and less of it's causing those feelings. But as it's being broken down, where is it going? Does the it components, the components are peed out. Oh, okay. So it breaks it down into little, little pieces, goes through our system. Broken down into waste products that we don't need. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. There's an interesting uh, thing that happens. People, if a person were to drink uh, something like a sour monkey, no, antifreeze, oh, oh, okay, like ethylene glycol, mm -hmm. or uh, toner from the copy machine. What will happen is that will circulate into their liver. That same enzyme that breaks down alcohol, that enzyme also breaks down the ethylene glycol. That's the dangerous stuff. And when it gets when that gets broken down, it gets turned into a very dangerous product called formaldehyde. You may have heard of formaldehyde. That's what we use to um, arrest the cells from deteriorating, which means we can store specimens almost indefinitely. Which would kill the patient. So if a person accidentally drank some of that um, toner fluid, or they intentionally maybe try to drink some toner fluid, and try we to intentionally die. Uh, um, tie pods. So I'm sorry. We we have intentionally ate tie pods. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so people do stupid things, um, but drinking. Antifreeze, you see that a lot in dogs, oh, yeah, because it looks it uh, looks like Gatorade basically, and it tastes sweet from what I've been told. Don't say what well, you do. So dogs sort of enjoy the flavor of it, but then it'll destroy and it'll kill them. So they can't, you know, you want to keep away from them. But if a kid got into it or a young person wanted to kill himself, drink some of it. One of the um, antidotes is alcohol. Ethanol. Because I said that enzyme in the liver that breaks down alcohol also breaks down this ethylene glycol, the poisonous stuff. So if you can get to this person quickly enough and start giving them some shots of tequila or vodka, then the, what will happen is that will go into their liver and their enzyme will say, okay. I would rather break down the alcohol than this other ethylene glycol stuff. So it uses up all that enzyme, so the ethylene glycol yeah, never gets, yeah, exactly, it substitutes. Mm -hmm. So the ethylene glycol, the poisonous stuff, never gets converted to formaldehyde, so the patient pees it right up. That saves their life. Thank you. Well, it, it is interesting because it was on an episode of Dr. House once, where a prison inmate um, tried to kill himself by drinking toner, and Dr. House in his Dr. House ways, uh, was interacting with the patient and said, all right, well, if you're gonna go, let's go on style. Let's have a couple of drinks to celebrate. The that little slime. And that's what I thought too. I thought, oh, I see what you're doing there. Um, so that was cool. And then on Fear the Walking Dead, which is not as good as The Walking Dead, but it's pretty good. Uh, on one of the last episodes, there, somebody had poisoned their water with like, um, I think antifreeze. And one of the people there, I think, was a nurse, and she said, oh, wait a minute, if we just drink some alcohol, so they all got lit, drinking, I don't know, what the, deep beer or something. But it saved their lives. Oh, my God. So it's, yeah. Always have liquor. Just in case.
Yeah. It's an, in case of emergency. You're really doing a service. Seriously. Yeah, it's a good thing. Not that little stuff, not that little flavorful stuff. No, some kettle water. Dry and then keep some blue cheese stuff all those nearby just in case. All those are blue cheese. Okay. Okay. Oh, we're talking about oxytocin, right? Not oxycontin. Oxytocin. That's the next one. This is our friend, oxytocin. Remember, this is made in the hypothalamus, but then it was not released into the blood. It goes and is stored in the posterior pituitary. Which then releases into the blood. Oxytocin is going to cause what we, uh, we call the letdown reflex. This is the ejection of milk from the breast when mom is breastfeeding, when the baby starts sucking, it causes this release of oxytocin, which causes the release of the milk. Or even if the baby is crying, which is amazing because. A baby crying in another room doesn't even have to be her baby. Could trigger the brain to release oxytocin to cause the breast to start leaking. Well, so that's true. Oh, I mean, so irritated. That's science. Man. I had a leaking. Mm. I had a crazy experience. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh my god! I thought I was crying. Can I something? Something's wrong with your brain. Oh yeah. Can I ask you a question? Okay. <laughs> So, when I deliver my son, right? Okay. I didn't have no milk in my chest. But I was told I did have milk in my chest. It was just some chest. chest. In, in my breast. breast. Okay. In my breast. I didn't need it. I couldn't produce, I mean, I couldn't. I couldn't have sweet. Nothing was coming out. Why? You just told me something was on my brain. Or, or. The point yeah, well, it could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did the doctors say? They say she hands syndrome or anything like that? No, she. They didn't say anything, right? And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have like any milk. I even had um, the breast pump for like two hours. No yeah, I didn't have a lot of milk either. But my six week, check out. Right. When he was left, they didn't say anything. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Okay, thank you. Weaker than the later ones. Oh, I'm not going to argue. Because it's not one. Yeah, so I'm not going to argue. Because that is now mental. But I'm not. Uh, mental so, it's important to realize this because we can use oxytocin right. if mom's uterine contractions are not as strong as I want them to be. And this is just taken way too long. I've got stuff to do. We can <laughs> we can give the patient exogenous oxytocin. Not endogenous. Endogenous means it comes from mom's brain and goes to mom's uterus. But if she's if they're taking too long with this, the contractions aren't as strong as we would like them to be. I can take oxytocin off of the shelf, exogenous oxytocin, and inject it. And that will do the same thing. Except we call that exogenous oxytocin pitocin. And you'll hear a lot about pitocin on the labor and delivery report. Mm -hmm. Also, so yeah, they'll be, they'll be induced and they'll be speeding up the process quite a bit. Because there's other ways we can change the cervix, for instance, if it's not working like it should. But like an insertion of medication that will break down the cervix. What if the cervix is all the way All the way back. Like what if the cervix is I know that some people cervix they like aren't I think you're thinking of the uterus overall, not just the cervix. Oh the uterus. All the way, all the way. uterus is all the way back. That's all right. The retrograde uterus? What's it called? Retrograde. Retrograde. Re retro I'm sorry, retroflexive, not retrograde. Retroflexion. Retro yeah, because antiflexion is the role. Oh okay. Then, those people retro Flexed. Retro flex. Are they all um, harder to reproduce? Is it harder? Not necessarily. Because uh -huh. yeah. you have to understand, human beings are built generally the same way, mm -hmm. but there's some variation. Mm -hmm. So the uterus should be tilted more forward like this. In some cases, it can be a little more like this. In some cases, it can be up like this. In some cases, it can be back like this. In some cases, it can be a little more back. In some cases, a little more back. So it really depends on the degree. Uh -huh. And of course. It should be like in the middle. Sometimes you tilt this way, sometimes you tilt this way, sometimes you're split. There's lots of different variations. Okay. So that all of those are going to decide uh, you know, how extreme the variation is going to help determine whether or not they can get pregnant. Oh, okay. can I, or carry as easily. Can now, hold, that's, hold, hold on one second, because i got to get on to this next stuff. We're getting way off topic. Mm -hmm. A little off topic. We're I know, but, but there's, there's a lot of stuff to cover yet today. Um, Everybody's familiar with the idea that if you get cut, if a person gets cut, how do you stop the bleeding? Pressure. Pressure. Everybody understands this, right? Mm -hmm. So if mom delivers a baby, and mom delivers a placenta, and mom's experiencing a lot of extra bleeding from inside of the uterus, how do we stop the bleeding? Pressure. How do you put pressure on the inside of the uterus? Mm -hmm. From the abdomen? Stomach, stomach's a different organ. Stomach's up here. By pressing on the abdomen? No. Or by pushing in and then you bring them in that room? Yeah, you just like you go like this and then you go like that. Well, how about this? How about you make the uterus put pressure on itself? So you continue contracting. So we're going to continue with the pitocin. Because then the uterus contracting on itself is going to help put that pressure on it, help control the bleeding. Help control the bleeding. Now you will see after mom delivers a baby, and even sometimes before, but then after delivering the placenta, you'll see the doctor sort of massaging her abdomen, not the stomach. Because he's massaging the top of that uterus, the fundus of that uterus. This is that. This is after the baby's born, typically, but it could be either before or after. Um, but what he's doing is he's trying to trick the placenta into thinking there's more inside of it that needs to come out. Mm -hmm. By putting that pressure on it, it's thinking, okay, I gotta keep getting that message, keep getting that message. So it says, keep sending the message, keep sending the message. So it can help expel the placenta, or if the placenta's out, it can help control the bleeding. It'll say, oh, it'll help shrink the uterus down. Well, that's gonna happen on its own, but um, 
but we're really concerned about the bleeding part and getting everything out part. Now, what else? At what other time does a female feel strong uterine contractions other than pregnancy? Uh, no. Uh, she has sex. Mm -hmm. Specifically, the female orgasm. The female orgasm used to be thought it was just for pair bonding, but there's a lot of evidence that says that the uterus contracting during that causes the cervix to sort of dip down into the vagina more, which helps to pick up more of the semen, which helps pick up more of the sperm, helps them get a Ooh. head start up the cervix, increases the likelihood of pregnancy. Ooh. Interesting. It is, uh, because sometimes, sometimes the body can make a mistake. Which is why every so often you'll hear a story about a woman who will say that when she's breastfeeding, she feels like she's going to have orgasm, or actually does. Really? I've never heard it. Listen. Mm -hmm. Oh. Exactly. A lot of women don't. It's a small percentage that actually admit to it. So um, something like two percent. So probably the number is higher than what a lot of women will say anything about it okay. because they don't want to be. Like yes, they don't want to be labeled as being weird. I thought that was but just a thing. I thought that whatever hormone caused arousal, I guess. I thought that was just more prevalent when you're pregnant, I guess. No oxytocin especially. This is also why if her contractions aren't as strong as we would like them to be, and they're not as regular as we would like them to be. We're, and our cervix isn't dilated enough because we're going to wait until it's at least four centimeters before we start giving the dose. I'm going to send her home. I'm going to say, go home, call your husband, tell him to come home from work, or your <laughs> other friend, turn the lights down, put on some music. Because that will help kickstart that oxytocin. So there's truth in that as well. You may have heard of that, but that's something that's actually true. Oh. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So that's not Back to the bleeding part um, after delivery. Why is that one of the reasons why they try to check your um, legs and stuff for a body? Well, one of the things, uh, one of the complications of delivering babies or pregnancy with delivering babies is the potential of forming clots. And if clots are formed, they can form in those deep veins in the leg. And if they're formed in the deep veins in the leg, that clot or part of that clot could break off and travel with the blood. And where do veins take blood? Everywhere. No. no. Oh, you said to, to the heart. All veins take blood to the heart. Which means if there's a clot in that blood now that is traveling to the heart, it's going to go to the right side of the heart. It's going to go to the top right chamber, the right atrium, which is going to go down to the left. I'm sorry, mm, I made the mistake. It's going to go down to the right ventricle, which is then going to pump it out of the heart into the lungs, which means that clot's going to get caught somewhere in the lungs and going to cause difficulty with breathing or worse. So that's why we check to see if there's any temperature change, if there's any pain, tenderness, swelling. And then we'll check her breathing as well. Put a stethoscope on it. We'll check her pulse as well. Remember, I think I said that unexplained tachycardia, the number one cause of unexplained tachycardia is uh, pulmonary embolism, the clock in the lungs. Hmm. You had a question before? Um, so. When a uterus is um, in a different position than, it's, than the natural position, quote unquote, um, does it make it difficult to, like, the, when the baby's in the womb, is the baby facing the other way? Is it, you know? I don't know what the percentage is, but I do know that even when the uterus is the way it's supposed to be, there's always potential for the baby to be facing the wrong way, or the placenta to implant in the wrong area. Gotcha. So I don't know if it's a, uh, depending upon the retroflex uterus or, uh, because because there's so many like I said there's so many degrees that 
that the uterus could be in a different position. I don't know if it's ever been narrowed down to what the percentage of babies being in a different position in this state versus this state of the uterus versus this state of the uterus. I'm not even familiar with that information or that has ever been considered. I'm sure it has somewhere. So I don't know. This is probably a stupid question. I'm talking about it on my own. But because we all know that babies are delivered at birth, well, naturally, that's how it's supposed to be delivered, right? What is it to, what is it that happens in here that gets the baby in that form? Like, how can they know that that's the form that's supposed to be in? Google. It's just the way that it's growing. It's going to, the shape of the uterus is going to dictate that um, the baby is going to be better in a different position. So as the baby is growing, it's sort of changing. The uterus is sort of helping it move in that shape. So, yeah, the ba remember the baby does, yeah, that's what we want. Base, Face down, head first. This is ideal. Because the way the head is starts off. Yeah. But as and then, the baby delivers in the birth canal, it's turning. Baby's coming. Baby's turning. As it's coming through. So when the head comes out, remember it sort of oh, yeah, turns this way and the shoulder turns with it. Mm -hmm. um, that's the uterus. The baby has nothing to do with being delivered. The uterus. Is the nice. uterus does all of the work. Yeah. The baby does nothing. The the baby is literally like toothpaste coming out of a tube. Mm -hmm. So it does nothing, which means every year you celebrate the day that you did nothing. <laughs> it should be called <laughs> uterus day. Mom's uterus day is what it should be called. Yeah, mom's celebrate your uterus day. That's why I always celebrate that. If that's the case, then they need a birthday on the <laughs> so you would have had to birth your own self too. Cool. Okay. All right. Yeah, I slipped out by myself, man. Okay. I definitely came out by myself. Okay. <laughs> almost, almost the floor. Almost. Almost. You sure? Are you sure? Is that what they told you? Oh, I'm the floor. Stretch back. Oh no, she didn't hit the floor. That's wrong. <laughs> Five second rule. My second rule. I mean, my brother. Five second rule. <laughs> my brother was born in a taxi. My cousin had her baby. My cousin was born on a curb. And they started calling her curb. That hurt. So I, I would still call her curb. That's awesome. Curb. I like that name, though. That's his name, Curb. Mm. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. Uh, we don't want the baby coming out feet first. Why? Because they could end up getting a choke. Like caught on their neck. But if they come out of feet first, they're more likely to get to caught stuck. With the shoulder. And if the baby's getting stuck, now we have a problem. Yeah, no. We gonna panic. We gonna panic. panic. It's not the panic part. It's, it's the remember the placenta separating. The baby's gonna get less blood, which means mom could, well, baby can die. Baby could lose blood to the brain. Get cerebral palsy. Um, my baby could die, mom could be bleeding, mom could die. So we don't want that to happen. So, so sometimes we'll try a version maneuver to try to change the baby's position before it's coming out. If you ever seen this done, the doctor will be like over top of moth, like this. Moving that belly around. Move, yeah. If you didn't know what was happening, if you just walked past, you would think that maybe she didn't pay her bill or something. Because it's pretty vigorous to try to get that. You're trying to move a baby. In a very small area. Yeah, in a, in a, within a tight space that's inside from the outside. So it's quite vigorous. You did that before, Dr. No. Yeah. You would? No. Because there's another way to cut the, get the baby out, isn't there? Yeah. So cut that baby out. Unfortunately, no, they should. No. They should definitely try. And the reason for that is because if they can do it, then it's a vaginal delivery, and that's it's good. That's great. always better because that's natural. That's what's supposed to happen. A cesarean delivery is an unnatural process. It's not supposed to happen. Oh, so you want to try to avoid that if you can. So they're just about to put in an extra effort to not do that. What about, what about, or you know how you was explaining how if a person has C-section, they're more, more likely to get another C-section. 
What about the water? It's advised. Yeah, what about uh, in the water? It's still the same thing. It's still possible. A water bird. Like, what if I they first had a C section, but now they decide, well, hey, let's try to see if we do the war water bird. Would it be the same effect as a natural bird? Okay. It still can cause terror. When they sit in the pool in years, that's why yeah. I think I need to have a natural you bird. You have to understand the tearing is the uterus that's tearing. Yeah. We're not talking about the perineum, we're not talking about the skin. We're not talking about the vagina, we're talking yeah. about the uterus. Yeah. And if that uterus tears while she's contracting, trying to push this baby out, then she's going to bleed. She's going to bleed internally. She could die. The baby then could die. That's not fair. It's, Every, it's not fair, I know. I don't I'll write a letter. Dear God, um, please don't let there be scar tissue after I cut open a patient. Sincerely, Robert. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not the doctor's fault that you get the disease. I mean, yeah, it's not the doctor's fault. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's why it's recommended. It's that's you don't have to. You don't even have to go to a hospital. Exactly. You can give birth in a taxi or on a curb. <laughs> Prepare for the nicknames that follow. That's so funny. Well, you can sign a little form. It's you called a VBAC, vaginal birth after cesarean. That says, I understand the risk that I might die, the baby might die, the baby might be paralyzed, the baby might be mentally challenged, mentally retarded. I understand all that, but I'm going to take the risk because I'm a selfish. I'm pretty and sure I read something on Facebook. No, so, I'm sure, I'll take that risk. Do you have a Facebook page? No. I know, because you hate Facebook. Why would I want Facebook? I want to say, nobody cares with Facebook. about me. Nobody cares about the old people. But you don't stand here. You're going to stand I talk to her in person or on the phone. All right. Right. She knows. The next part here. This is we're no longer in the pituitary gland, but we're still in the diencephalon, that part of the brain. This is more towards the back of the diencephalon, the pineal gland or the pineal body. Or people say the pineal, uh, which is fine. This is responsible for our circadian rhythm, our sleep-wake cycle. I was like, what? Why do you think you get tired at night? Why do you think you wake up in the morning? Because, because the lack of sunlight causes the release of melatonin. Ah, right here, release melatonin. Melatonin. Not melanin. Melanin is the pigment. Yeah. Melatonin is the hormone that says it's time to go to sleep. Yeah. And then as we get more sunlight, there's less release of that, so you wake up. That's also why you notice in the wintertime where we have these short days, long nights, you feel like you're a lot more tired uh, as compared to when spring rolls around and we change the clocks. Now suddenly it's not dark until like 8.30. You feel like you have a lot more energy all during the day. That's the reason for this. And they even sell this as a sleep aid. You can buy it in Walmart or CVS Pharmacy. Melatonin. But understand something. This melatonin sleep aid it's not the same as taking the Ambien. It's not the same as taking Benadryl. It's not like, well, I want to go to sleep, so I'll take one of these. It has to be taken regularly, and all it does is helps to regulate. So people get confused about that. They think it's like a, a sleeping pill that makes you go to sleep right away. It does not. So if you're buying this, it does not make you go to sleep right away. It is something that helps to regulate that cycle. But there are side effects, everything you put in your body. In some patients, they have something we call seasonal affective disorder, SAD, or SAD. And what happens is the increased melatonin actually causes depression. Severe depression. Depression meaning like they can't focus on anything in their world, their life, their school, their children, nothing during those months. So for those patients, what we recommend is that they move. If you're living in upstate New York and you're having these incredibly depressive months, get out of upstate New York. Move to an island named after a saint somewhere in the Caribbean. Give me my money back to the Caribbean. I was going to say, I would move today. You would be surprised how cheap other yeah, places you, are. You could live there easily. Like Panama and stuff. Really cheap. I would move to Panama. But, um, I probably would. <laughs> But we're talking about the person's life. 
I mean, what if the person was so depressed they end up killing themselves? Right. Or, or, or losing their job, losing their house? Now they have nobody. Right. They, they're even in a worse position. So we're talking about somebody's health over the long term. So sometimes you have to make big sacrifices to be healthy. What's, what's now, of course, everybody's going to say, well, I can't move that far of my old families here. Let me tell you something. Really if you move to the Caribbean, they will visit you. They'll find exactly. ways to visit you. Hey, oh, the, but then people house. will say, oh, I can't move. I don't have any money. All right, well, then be depressed. <laughs> well, can't you just give me a pill? Yeah, but that's going to come with side effects. And that's just going to treat the depression that's still going to be there. So another option is we can give them a special little UV light to sit in front of. Is and they sit, light? yeah, a special little light. They sit in front of it for an extra 20 minutes a day, up to an hour, like while they're on the computer or watching TV. And it tricks the brain into thinking they're getting more sunlight. So they're not going to release as much melatonin, so they're not going to have that depression. Oh, wow. Pretty sneaky. And people ask, well, can I just go into a tanning booth? Well, you could, in fact. But that's also going to come with another problem, exactly, skin potential cancer. for skin cancer. Better just to move. This is scary. Yeah, it's called a seasonal skin. affective disorder, or SAD. Patient becomes sad during that time. See, my mom always told me you're not supposed to take sleeping pills because they lead to addiction of other pills. Not well, again. Yeah, you don't want, don't take sleep. Listen to your mom, she's smart. Yes. Okay, so, I don't get the, I don't get sad, S-A-D, right? But around this season, like, um, like, fall and winter, everything I say was done, when it start getting dark um, early, I don't sleep. I can't sleep really. I don't know what it is. is it but when it starts getting you? lighter, darker, you can. used to be enough in there all the time. Like early? The seasons don't change that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, this is going off for it. What is wrong with you? I don't know. <laughs> her brain. She's I'm telling you. <laughs> 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 my brain. Yes. Okay. Have you spoken to your doctor? I'm this? speaking to him. You're not, no, I'm, not, to I'm not your doctor. <laughs> uh, I'm just a. Doctor, a terrible doctor at that. But oh, you're not a best doctor. Oh, I'm great, not. Great. Stupid, oh, no. stupid, dumb as a lot of hammers. So <laughs> I would say, I would say <laughs> speak to your doctor because what your doctor will probably say is, why don't we try giving you some melatonin supplements that you could buy at CVS pharmacy and see how that works over a period of time and see if that helps. That's probably what they would do. Or if he was more aggressive, he'd just say, here, have some game with me. Go to sleep and leave. You know, really I forgot the name again. All right, so with, with me not sleeping, remember I told you when I get headaches, like when you're trying to catch a headache, and I went to the neurologist, and they gave me this medication that was the antidepressant. It's called, I'm so mad. It's okay. I probably don't know what it is anymore. Okay. But it was it, it's an antidepressant. So they gave that to me for the help with the headache and to help me sleep. But I don't want to take it. Okay. But I'm saying that's what they gave. Right. Well, you have to understand something though. Um, lot, tri patients tri with type one diabetes. Patients with type one diabetes don't want to take insulin, uh, but they do because that's the disease they have and that's the treatment. So if the disease that you have is insomnia and or depression and or some of the other things that we've already mentioned, uh, then there's treatment for those. You don't have to follow um. the treatment, but that's what we have right now. Not all doctors agree with what treatment works best because um, we understand how these medications work. We understand the side effects of some doctors will be less concerned about the side effects and more concerned about the effect, and some doctors will be less concerned about the effects and more concerned about the side effects. So there's always going to be that, well, I think this one's a little bit better, I think this one's a little bit better. But they're all going to have those, those pros and cons, right? So if you don't like that, go to another doctor. Ask your doctor for an alternative. Is it amitriptyline? Yeah. Amitriptyline? A generic... 
tricyclic. Tricyclic. Tri yeah. Tricyclic. Is it antidepressant? Tricyclic antidepressant. Antidepressant helps migraines. Jesus. So listen to the eyes and just that day. I don't know why either, but it's, 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 it's not unusual. Uh, you yeah. Don't it's, yeah, it's not uncommon for something like that. It? And then, again, this oh, based on, it's also based on why somebody's not sleeping. It's also based on um, what else is in their chart, all their other information, all their other medical information, as well as medications that they're taking. Because you have to weigh out all those other things as well. So sometimes um, one medication like that shows you some of the other ones. Because of um, the things like side effects. Yeah. Especially, yeah. Uh, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to get too personal. No, I was like, I think it was flexible because, well, with me and my mom is crazy because we had, we got prescribed the same medication for different symptoms, different reasons. Mm -hmm. She got prescribed, I, I'm not sure if it's flexible. I don't want to, I want I don't want to say that. Medicine. She got prescribed the medicine for sleep. I got prescribed the medicine for my anxiety. Okay. Which, which I yeah, but it's not crazy because if a kid has um, a fever, what are you going to give them? Tylenol. Tylenol, right? Children's Tylenol. Uh, if, if we want to give them anything, we give them children's Tylenol. If a child has pain, what are you going to give them? Tylenol. Um, those are two different things, though. Pain is different from fever. Mm -hmm. okay. So you're getting the same medication for different things. Like, mom, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you all have to do is call you down. It does. She like, no, I'm going to sleep. I'm going to wake up. Yeah. Yeah, relax. All right, where's the thyroid gland located? Uh, right here. <laughs> this is the thyroid, not the thigh, not the cartilage. This cartilage is often called the thyroid cartilage, even though it's above the thyroid. This is why I call it the laryngeal cartilage, because it's more around the larynx, and the laryngeal prominence is the Adam's apple. So if you put your fingers right down at the base of your neck, and you swallow, you'll feel your thyroid come up and touch your fingertips there. Um, the thyroid releases these two, three hormones. There's three hormones here the thyroid releases that you're gonna need to know about at some point. Um, notice T3 and T4. T3 is known as thyroidine, T4 is known as thyroxine. Everybody calls them T3 and T4. You don't need to Wait, know the long right? names. Okay. <laughs> Both of these hormones do the same thing. T3 and T4 do the same thing. They increase metabolism. <laughs> What's wrong? Can't see still? No, I can't see. Oh, no. I honestly can't see. Can you have some water? I'm saying. I just want to write this thing. I'm just going to stand back. I'm just going to stand right here. T3 and T4 is basically the same? Or no? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to see if I could sneak up and wouldn't even notice. I don't know where's he going. Yeah, well, I asked him a question. I'm waiting for the answer. I guess I have to answer. <laughs> what did you ask me? You said T3 and T4. Are the same. They do the same thing. Oh, they increase okay. metabolism. Okay. Remember, metabolism is the rate of things that happen in the body? Yes. Okay. So, more T3 and T4, if they just speed up. Less T3 and T4, things are slowing down. That's probably bad. So, the difference between them is their potency. T3 is much more potent than T4. Again, sort of like a shot of whiskey versus a beer. They both contain the same amount of alcohol, but the potency of the whiskey is a lot more because it's more concentrated. 
Also, in order to make these hormones, we have to have iodine in our diet. From where do we get iodine? Fish. Fish, yeah, but salt. We add iodine to our salt. We do that on purpose just to make sure our thyroid is working correctly. But you, hold on. You saying the T3 and T4 need? It, yes. It develops? In order to create, especially T3. In order, in order to, to create, create them. It. Yes, okay. we have to have iodine. Hmm. It creates a, a platform. It creates a, a countertop. How about that? In order to make these things, in order to bake a cake, you have to have a countertop in order to put the dough and roll it. Wait, do you roll out dough for cakes? No. What do you roll out dough for? Pizza. Pizza. Okay. To roll out dough for pizza or things, you have to have something to put all this stuff on. Cake. So, okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> so it acts that way. Without that, you, you can't make this stuff. So we have to have iodine or iodine. Now, I say they both do the same thing increase metabolism. They're just with different potency. More potent, less potent. But if we need it, we can actually even make convert this into this if we needed it. So if you look at thyroid, there's one, two, and three hormones that you need to know. About. <coughs> that third one is called calcitonin. And what calcitonin is going to do is it's going to help to regulate the amount of calcium that's in the blood. Okay. No! If there is if there is too much calcium in the blood and we but we need it, the body's gonna to want to store it, and the body's gonna store it in the bones. So it moves calcium from the blood into the bones. What cell is gonna help build up that bone to put the calcium in? Right, what cell to build up the bone? Oh, osteoblasts. Osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are going to help out with this process of putting the calcium into the bone. And vitamin D. Vitamin D is required to help get the calcium into the bones. The parathyroid glands, now these are small. If we were to remove that thyroid from Pat's neck, or from your neck, and you would spin it around and look at the back of it, there's four dots called the parathyroid glands. And the parathyroid glands release the parathyroid hormone. The parathyroid hormone, well, it actually does just the opposite of calcitonin. It'll help put some of that Calcium back in the blood if it's needed. What cell is going to help get release that from the bones? Osteoclasts. Osteoclasts. So you see a couple of different things when we talk about the thyroid and the parathyroid. One thing you see is that we have two hormones here, T3 and T4, that are doing the same thing. They are working together. We call that synergism. Working together. Synergism. And then we also see here with calcitonin and parathyroid hormone, what we see is antagonism. They're working opposite of one another. But realize just because they're working opposite of one another doesn't mean that they're not released at the same time, or at least found in the blood at the same time. You would think, well, that wouldn't make sense because then they would be doing opposite effects and that would have no effect. But that's just like. That's just like, or think of that shower. The shower, we use hot water. The shower, we use cold water. We use them both at the same time. But just we use them just to balance each other out. And there are times where, yeah, we have to turn this one up and turn this one down. There's times where we have to turn the other one up and turn the other one down. But in order to keep that just right amount, that homeostasis, yeah, we're going to have to see them both being used at the same time. And, and, and that, that is to, to, um, to again, maintain metabolism. Yes, homeostasis. Okay. okay, the thymus, I'm not going to talk too much about. But I'm going to tell you the things that you need to know about the thymus. There's two things that you need to know about the thymus. The thymus is located 
the thoracic cavity, behind the bones of the sternum, right here. It's in the thoracic cavity located right here. Okay. 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 Okay.
It's behind the stomach, posterior to the stomach. To who? Are we talking about the pancreas? Yep. Mm -hmm. Triangular shape tucked inside of that first part of the small intestines, the duodenum. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's tucked inside of there is because it's going to release hormones. I'm sorry. It's going to re release enzymes that's going to help with digestion right into the first part of the small intestines. So as soon as the stuff leaves the stomach, going right into here, now we have digestive enzymes from the pancreas. Notice the pancreas comes to a point, more or less. Points right over to the spleen. I look almost like a tongue. Okay, yeah. Tongue <laughs> Points right over to the spleen. Oh, that's the, okay. Those are muscles of this. These are, that's our arteries. So, of course, yes, posterior to the stomach, pointed over to the spleen, um, is made up of a head, a body, and a tail, but you don't need to know that. It plays a role in the digestive system because it releases hormones into the, I keep saying hormones, damn it. Enzymes. It releases enzymes digestive enzymes right into the first part of the small intestines. But we're talking about the endocrine system. So we have to talk about the hormones that it releases. And I've listed three of them, but there's two that you need to really know about. But there's nothing to worry about. Okay. The two are called glucagon and insulin. This is These are released from areas of cells called the islets of Lagerhans. And there are alpha cells that release glucagon, beta cells that release insulin. These two hormones are antagonists. They work opposite of one another. We say that Glucagon is released in the starvation state, and insulin is released in the well-fed state. But realize when we say starvation, we don't mean they've been on a life raft in the middle of the ocean for four days. We mean that you had breakfast, a little light breakfast, you had toast, and then you came to class and you forgot to bring anything for lunch, you're going to have to wait till 2 o'clock to eat. So what's going to happen is your body's going to release more glucagon, that's going to call for those reserves. Remember, glycogen, the hall closet. That's going to say, come on, glucose, we need you back with glucose now. And then it puts that glucose back in the blood. That helps to maintain that nice, steady glucose blood level. Insulin, we say, is released during the well-fed state because, of course, insulin does what? What does insulin do? It brings sugar into the cells. It delivers sugar into the cells. Insulin's the delivery guy. It brings that glucose to the cells and opens up the door for those cells to get glucose to go inside. Because it's got the code, remember? It can open the door. Don't worry about some of the stuff. So glucagon and insulin work opposite of one another. But just because they're working opposite doesn't mean they're not simultaneously working at the same time. Because remember, hot and cold water, there are times where you have that perfect balance, and then there are times where somebody flushes the toilet. So you gotta turn this one down a little, you gotta turn the other one up, or vice versa. These are incredibly important. Glucagon, insulin. What time is it? Okay. We are way behind. Way behind. So far. Let's get it. I'm getting it. Uh, let's skip down to the adrenal glands. If you don't know where the adrenal glands are located, I will show you right now. I'll show you this one. Oh, God, I don't have the camera. Let's okay. It's very sad. So we were poor. I just sold them on the black market. It doesn't exist. All right, look. Kidneys, you see them? Yes. You see them? Kidneys, two of them. They're shaped like kidney beans. Not surprising. If you look on the superior aspect of them, they have a little cap on them. That little cap, the adrenal glands. 
That's what that is. Those adrenal glands are made of two parts, inner part, well, two basic parts, an inner part and an outer part. The outer part's called the cortex, the inner part's called the medulla. But understand, you'll hear these terms in other parts of the body as well. When you hear the terms cortex and medulla, the medulla is the inner part, the cortex is more towards the outside. So, with the adrenal glands, the adrenal cortex secretes three types of hormones. What did you say about the cortex? About the movement. It's in the outside, and the medulla is in the inside. I'm still on blue for the cup. Yeah, right, faster. There are three hormones released from the adrenal glands. Three types of hormones. Mineral corticoids, glucocorticoids, and the androgens. Uh, the mineral corticoids include, what did I give you? Aldosterone, I believe. Yes, aldosterone. Aldosterone is a hormone that helps to regulate the amount of salt that's in the blood. What follows salt? Water. So if we put more salt in the blood, we have more water in the blood. What's it going to do for blood pressure? Make it elevate. Increase. So this helps to regulate blood pressure in a roundabout way. Aldosterone controls the amount of salt that's in the blood, which will then control the amount of water that's in the blood. which will then help control blood pressure. Uh, the glucocorticoid that I've given you here is called cortisol. Where the hell is it? Oh, like cortisol, which increases. Well, it helps to direct blood glucose, like how much should be in the blood and where it's going to be. often referred to as the stress hormone, because when you're in times of stress, your body increases the release of this. Does that make sense? Because that's going to help deliver the glucose to where it needs to go. What? Which one? Cortisol. A few years ago, they used to sell a product on television, some pill. They would say, if you're fat, it's not your fault. Your body's releasing too much cortisol. That sounds wonderful. I thought it was, I was fat because of all the donuts, but no, it's not my fault. Cortisol. The problem with that um, marketing is that there's some truth in it. Because increased cortisol can, in fact, increase areas of things like belly fat. We call it truncal obesity. However, the majority of it is from all the donuts. So it would help it be a very, very a small contribution as compared to Krispy Kreme contribution. The androgens, uh, these are the hormones of libido, sex drive. So that's just the outer part of those little uh, adrenal caps sitting on top of the, the kidneys. That's just the outer part, the cortex. There's three different layers to it. I don't think I put the layers names in there, do I? They're called the zonas. What is it? Zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. I don't think I put them down the same way. The inner layer, the inner part, is called the adrenal medulla, which creates and secretes epinephrine and norepinephrine. Uh, epinephrine is what people call adrenaline. So it's released during times of fight or flight, being chased by a bear. Remember, if you're being chased by a bear, you do not have to run faster than the bear. You just have to run faster than the person next to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a hundred dollars more than one. Never mind, fancy. 
If you look at the bottom of that, if you can actually see it, you'll notice I have something about neuroinflammatory neurotransmitter, blah, 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 um, about the methyl group. All that's in italicies for a reason. That's for the paramedic students. You don't need to know that. Okay, where are the ovaries found? First of all, how many ovaries are there? Two. There are actually <laughs> two ovaries. Uh, they're found in the pelvic cavity. Uh, and the ovaries, as part of the endocrine system, secrete estrogen. It starts out as estradiol, which has estrogen, and progesterone. The testes found in the male. How many testes are there? Two. Also two. You are correct. Found located in the scrotum. Yes. Wait, um, the ovaries secrete estrogen and progesterone. The testes secrete testosterone, the most abundant and biologically active of the male hormones. So, obviously, we're going to talk more about the ovaries and the testes when we visit the female and male reproductive systems, respectively. That's all you need to know. Ovaries, and estrogen, progesterone, testes, testosterone. What was your question? Okay, here's the complicated stuff physiology of the endocrine system. Here's the bad news it's complicated. Here's the good news. We kind of already did it. Endocrine system functions in a chain reaction, right? Where hormone is released to another organ, which releases another hormone, which releases another organ, which releases another hormone. Uh, the hormones can be either stimulatory or inhibitory. We talked about that. They either tell an organ of glands to do something or specifically tell them not to do something. And we said that the hormones can work in synergism. In other words, they're doing the same job. like T3 and T4, or they can be antagonists, where they're working opposite of one another, like glucagon and insulin. So we already talked about all that. So that's good. We got out of the way. So we'll talk about when good hormones go bad, pathology. And the first thing you see here is hirsutism. Excessive hair growth. Why is that in it? Oh, like anywhere? Anywhere. Um, anywhere. Is that like when women produce facial hair? Yep. Thicker than usual ones? Yep. <coughs> is that why you Yeah, that's what I just asked. I got a strong one. Like this. Oh. And this is a male hair growth pattern as well. Yes. Oh, that's a woman? Yes. Oh. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a man. That's a boy. That's a female. Sure. So, yes. so the top one could be a male as well, but you guys accept that that's a female. I'm telling you it's a female. If you, you, you want to believe it's a male, that's fine. <laughs> um, but it's a female. Is it her bit? Is the hair weak? Yes. Yeah. Like I said, this is a male hair growth pattern as well. Women have a different yeah. hair growth pattern on their body than men. Yeah. So not only is it a male hair growth pattern, it's darker, there's more of it. Whoa, man. Is this piece of glass? Actually, it's piece of uh, Stein Lieventhal syndrome, what you mean. Oh. Right? Yeah. You mean to say polycystic ovarian syndrome? Yeah, but don't you have. I was, well, was going to say. Okay. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is very, very common. You see two things one is uh, hirsutism, and the other is weight gain. Those are really two things that come out more than anything else. Ironically, um, well, 
questions there while I believe. This is the result of a change in the balance of the hormones. Right? Women produce testosterone. Women produce estrogen. And they have this balance of the two. It's not a 50-50 balance. It's a this much estrogen, this much testosterone. But sometimes, if they produce a little excess testosterone or a little less estrogen, now the balance has shifted. So it doesn't have to be like they're producing no estrogen and only testosterone. It doesn't mean like something that produces this much testosterone. It just means the balance, balance has changed a little bit. Mm. And that could be enough to really start, you can start seeing it manifest. Mm. Men, women produce, they make estrogen and testosterone. Men make testosterone. They don't actually make estrogen. Um, we do have estrogen and we sort of convert into estrogen, but we don't actually make it, make it like women make the two separate ones. This is here. This is here statistic. Okay. Um, can men have here Yes. They probably no. Have you ever gone to the beach no. and uh, seen a guy take his shirt off and now looks like he's wearing a sweater? Oh, you've got sweater? You can see, you see here. Just, uh, uh, um, you can see it in werewolf syndrome. That's, that's, is that true? That's real. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you go back to that one? Nope. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Oh, God. Here's the in men. So yes. Yeah, that's the picture that comes to mind, the one in the bottom. Yeah, three in. One in the group. Yeah, that's the picture that comes to mind. Yeah. Not a real world. Is that one right there real? This one on there. Next one. Mm -hmm. The other one. Man. Looks like tree man to me. Is that how right there though? That one, I don't know. That looks like a lot of air. Even with the symbol. Yeah, he's got okay. a sweater on. Excuse <coughs> me. Galactorrhea. Hypersecretion of prolactin will cause secretion of milk. They're going to make so much milk with some more meat. Even though the uh, person is not lactating. The book will tell you this is caused by a tumor, an adrenal tumor. I will tell you that this is the more common reason the side effects of medications. Um, Antipsychotics, um, especially well known for me, for causing galactorrhea. And then any two are present in the pituitary and always increase by lactate. That's what the correct one is. Failure of lactation. <clears throat> um, subtle cough. <clears throat> Failure of lactation. Hyposecretion of prolactin. So, why that happens? Well, now we have to investigate. But how would I know that there was less prolactin? Failure of cough. I checked the blood. If I drew the blood and I saw that the prolactin was low, then I would know this is either a problem with the pituitary gland or the hypothalamus. If the prolactin was fine, then I'd say, okay, this is more of a reason uh, at the breast itself. Hypersecretion of growth hormone, look at this. There's two types of hypersecretion of growth hormone. Gigantism, hypersecretion of growth hormone during childhood or puberty. Look what Whoa. happens. Hmm. Everyone around the person shrinks. No, wait. Uh, the person grows very tall. That's right. <laughs> a gigantism. This is caused by an increase in growth hormone during childhood and puberty. This is bad. Yeah. Not just because you can't find clothes that fit. Well, you can't find a house that fits. This is <laughs> bad. No, because everything, everything's growing. 
and everything's going to keep up with this, including the lungs the and the heart. Mm -hmm. So the heart is enlarging. Which means it's they die. They die usually in their 20s. That sucks. Yes. Wow. So every once in a while, you will hear something about the tallest girl in the world, yep. the tallest boy in the world. 15 years old, she's already seven foot three. But they'll say she has to have an operation or she'll die. A little late on that, but thank you. Thanks for trying. Gappy. Yeah. Old age. Well, they're meant to. Oh. Oh, Someone removed them. Was that you? Yeah. So, the gigantism, this is a bad thing because these people are going to die of heart failure in their 20s. So, that's why they'll say she has to have an operation, she didn't die, but yes, an operation, she didn't die. Which is why you don't see this in the United States. Why? You wouldn't let it get that far. Because what do we do when we have kids in the mm -hmm. pediatrician's we measure office? Their we measure their height, their weight, their head circumference. We check all those things. Mm -hmm. And if we suddenly see there's a change, we start drawing blood. And if we suddenly see there's a change, then we fix it. What you do? Yeah, do surgery on the pituitary gland. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done surgery on the No. Don't be too stunned by that, smart. Please. Two okay, so real surgery. This happens. Not very smart. I think so. I'm just stupid. Dumb as a bowl of soup. So, send it. Broken hammers of that. This is the result of increased growth hormone during childhood or puberty. But what happens if a person's like in their 30s and starts having an increased? A growth hormone. Are they going to grow taller? No. Why not? Everything's already fused. Everything's already fused, so they're not going to grow any taller. However, there will definitely be changes that we can see. It'll look like this. This is the progression what is of increased growth hormone. I don't even know what's different. During adulthood. We'll see our jaw is spread off. Okay. The size of her cranium was increased because her bone got thicker. Her fingers, that's why she has her hands up like this, to show how thick her fingers have gotten. They'll say they can't wear rings anymore. They had to have their rings cut off their hands. They'll say that their feet, uh, their shoe size has always been a 10 and a half regular, and now it's an 11 and a half extra wide. What's the speed of progression of this? Years. Again, if we go this weekend, if we go out to King of Prussia Mall, and sit in the food court, watch people go by, and we'll see this. I want to say she looked like an old person. That's why I couldn't figure out what was wrong. I mean, right. like, she still that's, that's looks like the problem is she's probably like 29. Right? That's your impression of old people. Okay. No, but it, it looked like she looked like eight, she could so just be an older person. That doesn't look like really saying. much has happened. So, was she just really 29 in that picture or something? No. She really is old? She's older. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, he's disrespectful. This is called acromegaly. Oh, okay. Yeah, that looks crimson chin. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it looks like they just get a long face. Wow. Wait, is the and black and white one is the right the before? Oh, look at it. Before or after. Okay. Oh, wow. Interesting. 1988, 1998, 1999, 2000. And that's not that far away. That honestly just looks like she's getting older. Dang. What the hell? Bro, I was like, bro, I'm so Oh, I see. Yes. Is he, real? Is he real? He's a wrestler. Yes. Whoa. Where's that? Look at that tongue. Why does it look like? I don't know. Hey. 
Okay. Oh, I saw that was the Shrek guy. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. yes, that is actually the Shrek guy. You're right. Um, this was a, he, I think this guy was a wrestler and a, uh, maybe a sideshow act or something. Yeah. yeah. In years past. This is actually Shrek. what they modeled the Shrek character from. Yes. Wow. That's yeah. That's so I awesome. would feel so offended. I mean, he knows what he looks like. No. I know what that I his look girlfriend? like. People model, people model an uh, animated oh, creature after me. They'd be like, yeah, okay, that's what I look like. I mean, a stupid, tubby, dumb, loving his... animated creature. I mean, yeah, that's me. Is that his girl? Sorry, Wouldn't they be like Homer Simpson? Oh my god, I'm one of them. Yeah, hey, look, there's no pictures. Wow, look at that so, doctor. <laughs> this is this is actually not acromegaly. This is people confused. This is yeah, gigantism. 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 Happens during childhood or puberty. Shh, listen. Acromegaly happens during adulthood. Acro means extremities. I was just going to say. Yeah. So this is how you remember the two. Because both of them are caused by the same thing. Too much growth hormone. Megaly is an enlargement of your extremities. Yeah. Acromegaly is okay. enlargement of extremities. But here's how I always remembered it. Who believes in giants? Children. And some people in this class. But children. It's true. Children believe in giants, so gigantism happens in yeah. childhood. Yeah. Acromegaly happens with adults, acro with an A, adults with an A. That's just how I always kept them straight. Oh, okay. Oh. So, what if there's not enough growth hormone? Good. Well, then you're a little small. Dwarfism. A hyposecretion of growth hormone can cause dwarfism. But there's lots of different reasons for it. Alright, let's right, see, we're at a break time. Let's take a break. That's a lot to say. Sorry. That's why it's easy to say SIADH. So it's these patients are releasing too much antidiuretic hormone. Remember, antidiuretic hormone stops the patient from getting up too much water. Mm -hmm. so, it's so they're really going to not pee a lot. This person's going to pee like twice a day, the entire day. And they're going to say it's really dark. Now, again, your book's going to tell you that this is probably from a tumor, uh, an, an adenoid tumor, a glandular tumor. Uh, but the reality is, the more common reason is what we call perineoplastic syndrome, which is caused from cancer. The patient has cancer in their lungs, and that creates a hormone that is similar to the triggering hormone to release antidiuretic hormone. So they release extra antidiuretic hormone. That's different from diabetes insipidus. Notice right here, diabetes insipidus. This has nothing to do with blood sugar. Diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with blood sugar. This is not diabetes mellitus. Diabetes insipidus. Not enough antidiuretic hormone. So these patients are going to be a lot. Um, one of the causes, I, tr I teach the paramedic students about this while we're here. One of the causes is head trauma. And that goes back to this right here. Remember, antidiuretic hormone is made here, but it's stored here and then released into the blood. Well, if they have head trauma, that can be separated. Mm. And now that hormone never gets to the posterior pituitary gland, which means it never gets released into the blood. Mm. Um, a lithium toxicity is another well-known cause. Mm. That's why I need to know that. Postpartum hemorrhage, mongolers of baby, mongolers of placenta, monstral bleeding, what are going to give her? I'm sorry, so what? Postpartum hemorrhage. Mom delivers a baby, mom delivers placenta, mom is still bleeding. What are we going to give her? Um, Pitocin. Remember, it's going to keep the contractions going. Oh, Pitocin. Yeah, Pitocin, oxytocin. Uterine inertia. Mom's uterus is not doing a great job of pushing that baby out. What are we going to give her? We're going to give her Pitocin, oxytocin. We talked about sad, seasonal affective disorder. Uh, goiter. Oh, i got to show you a picture of goiter. 
so you know what you're missing out on. Um, I don't think you want it. Okay, that's fine. Worldwide, the number one cause of lawyers is a decrease in oh, yeah, iodine in the diet. That's the number one cause of lawyer, decrease of iodine worldwide. Huh. Decrease of iodine in the diet. Where do we get our iodine? Salt. Salt. Good. There's nowhere else you can get it? Yeah, fish, fish plants, we can leach into the soil. Hmm. But why take the chance? Okay, these two are good stuff to know about, yes. Do they all go there? No. No. They're there forever. Okay. Even if they do get iodine in their diet, it's still there. Wow, okay. Uh, hyper and hypothyroidism. You're going to know somebody. Somebody in your family is going to be diagnosed with one of these, at least one. Hyperthyroidism, listen to this. Everything speeds up. Hyperscretion of T3 and T4. Increased T3 and T4 will cause metabolism to speed up. The patient will have things like tremors, tachycardia, heat intolerance. They're going to have a heat intolerance because everything is speeding up. So if metabolism is speeding up, they're going to create more heat. So as they create more heat, their body temperature is always going to be a little bit higher than the people around them. So they're sitting in the class going, yeah, it's comfortable in here. Where everybody else is like, I need a blanket. Uh, palpitation, I feel the extra contraction of the cardiac cycle. Restlessness and nervousness. Everything is speeding up. So they're producing more or less energy. More. They're producing more energy. Which means they're always going to be tapping their fingers, tapping their toes, doing something to burn off that energy. Diarrhea, because everything is moving fast, including them to the bathroom. Generalized weight loss. Are they going to be storing fuel if they're running their engine like this? Nope, they're going to be burning through fuel. Now the problems that arise with this, I think that's next, right down. Yeah. This is something called a thyroid storm. Remember, they're already a tachycardia. That tachycardia might become a flutter or a fibrillation, which would be dangerous. Professionals of points. Most common cause of hyperthyroidism is Graves' disease. You'll hear about that one. You'll see that exophthalmus, the bulging eyes. Yeah. And exophthalmus. What's <laughs> Somebody with hyperthyroidism? Well, their thyroid can grow, which can cause them to have hyperthyroidism. Okay, but always you'll see. So, often tight in Graves' disease. So, we're going to have to take the thyroid out. But if we take the thyroid out, now they're not going to produce any thyroid hormones. So, what are we going to have to give them? Hormones. Thyroid hormones, literally called synthroid, synthetic thyroid hormones. So we took them from being hyperthyroid to hypo. Way hypo. And now we have to correct that. So what is hypothyroidism? Decreased T3 and T4 means things are going to slow, slow down. down. These patients are going to complain of fatigue, cold intolerance, because they're making less energy, so they're making less heat. So their body temperature is always going to be a little bit lower. So everybody else is sitting in the classroom going, yeah, it's comfortable here. They're sitting there going, it is freezing. I'm going to say it's not freezing. Constipation, because everything's slowing down. And of course, they're not burning through fuel at all, so they're going to have weight gain. Lateral thinning of the eyebrows, something sort of unique in hypothyroidism. Lateral thinning from the edges this way. Really? They fall out. Lateral thinning. It's not from them pulling or plucking or shaving or waxing or threading. Hmm. It's that they're just falling out. So the eyebrows are actually start to look smaller and shorter. Right. Most severe complication is a is a coma-like state called myxedema. Everything slowed down too much. Most common form of hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Congenital hypothyroidism. We test every child in the United States at birth for congenital hypothyroidism because, of course. Hypothyroidism can cause a lot of problems here. And of course, for this patient, we're going to give them synthetic thyroid. But if a baby's born with it, 
Mm -hmm. And other things aren't going to develop very well, like their brain. They're going to have mental retardation. Mm. We call it cretinism as a result of congenital hypothyroidism. So we test every child in the United States because if they have hypothyroidism, what are we going to give them? Synthetic thyroid hormone. And that's going to correct for it. And it's going to fix it. And now they're not going to be mentally retarded. So it's an easy fix. All you got to do is catch it. Okay, hyper, hyperparathyroid, hyper, and hypoparathyroidism. If they're mentally retarded, yes. No. If we fix it, no, it'll be fine. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Nobody wants a child who's mentally retarded. No one does. How is it true? This is true. Probably. Blood, yeah. All you gotta do is get a specimen of their blood. We'll say, we'll test for a bunch of different things. Testing negative on the probe or the blood? But we'll test for glycosemia, biotinidase, congenital uh, <clears throat> hypothyroidism, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And fetal ketone urea. That's a lot. And if they're at risk, G6PD, uh, sickle cell. If you remember, the parathyroid hormone is what takes calcium from the bone, puts it in the blood. If you have hyperparathyroidism and there's too much of the hormone, which means too much calcium in the blood, it means bones will be deficient, they'll be weaker. Hypo means uh, there's not going to be enough calcium being released, there'll be more in the bone, that's going to be there. Okay, now we're going to get to the good stuff. We're running out of time. Let me explain to you what we see here. Diabetes mellitus. So when somebody says they have diabetes, this is what they're talking about. Diabetes mellitus. Where they say they have high blood sugar. So blood sugar disease. So there's two main types of diabetes mellitus. Type 1 and type 2. We're going to ignore the other types for right now. There's two main types. Type 1 and type 2. Type 1 diabetes used to be called... Insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, or IDDM, we don't call it that anymore. Type 1 diabetes used to be called juvenile diabetes, we don't call it that anymore, it's called type 1 diabetes mellitus. Age of onset is very young to in their 20s. Person is producing little to no insulin. Might be genetic, maybe there is an error, they didn't have the directions. Or maybe it's caused by a virus. Because if we don't know what causes something, we blame it on a virus. And if we don't know which virus, we blame it on the Epstein Barr virus. Or oh, God, I guess blame for everything. People are, these, these people here are making little to no insulin. So what are we going to give them? Insulin. Insulin. Notice the treatment plan for type 1 diabetic. The first thing we're going to give them is insulin. Then, the second part is lifestyle modifications. We want to make sure they're eating healthy and exercising, getting the right foods, and moving like they're supposed to. Simple enough. Type 2 diabetes mellitus used to be called adult onset diabetes mellitus. We don't call it anymore. We call it type 2. Type 2 diabetes mellitus used to be called adult. No, wait. I just said that one. Used to be called NIDDM, non-insulin dependent type, uh, non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. We don't call that anymore. We call it type two. Ah, age of onset. Well, here's the thing. It used to be there was a time where we wouldn't see this until the patients were into their elder years, over 65. And the reason for this is because as we go through life and we get into our older and elder years, things start to break down. Why? Because they're old. So, using something normally, over a long period of time, normal wear and tear, it's gonna break down. So in some patients, we'd see this breakdown. We're going to have to give these patients something. Now, what we give them was a, is a pill, metformin or glucophage, you may have heard of that. And what that's going to do, that does not replace insulin. What that does is that sort of helps grease the wheels a little bit, gets everything turning a little bit, making all those parts that are starting to break down, keeps them working a bit better for a bit longer. 
and that'll work for a while, and then eventually the patient will die because they're 90 years old. They're old. But then we start seeing the patients in their 50s, even in the 40s. I mean, you give them a pill, and it works for a while, and it works for a while, and then they die because they're in their 70s, 80s, maybe even 90. But when these people are in their 40s, especially early 40s, and we start seeing this, we give them a pill, it works for a while, give them a pill, it works for a while, give them a pill, it works for a while, and then it doesn't work anymore. So now we have to give them insulin, which means we can no longer call, call this non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus because if it happens at an early age like this, they're going to have to get insulin at some point in time. They can go from stage to the stage one. No, it's not. That's the thing. It's not. They're not stages. These are types. Oh, well, I'm into. Yeah, it's. This is why they changed the names because type one starts out from the scratch as <coughs> a problem. Mm -hmm. Type 2, there isn't a problem, a problem develops over time. And the reason that problem develops over time is because we're human beings and things break down. Normal wear and tear, things break down over our lifetime. However, the more you use something, the faster it's going to break down. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's what started happening. People were using all that machinery at a much faster rate. And the reason for that was because they started eating more food and moving less. I have a question. They start, you gotta wait, please. They got, they're eating a lot more junk food and they're moving around a lot less. Because if you look back in time, if you look at any of those newsreels from the 1940s, and you look at people in New York City in the streets, walking around doing their daily things, look at how many of them are overweight. Not many. And the reason for that is because they didn't have all-you-can-eat buffets. They didn't have servings of food that were this big. They didn't have drinks that were this big. You know, even when I was started as a kid going to McDonald's, the, the, uh, there was no adult meal or kid meal. It was the meal. The meal was you get a cheeseburger and a fry and a drink, and that was it. Everybody. So... What became available was that not only more food, bigger portions, a lot more carbohydrates, a lot more junk food, and food available anytime you want it. When I was a kid back in the 1920s, if we wanted to eat and there was no food in the house, it was 9 o'clock at night, we had to wait till the next morning to eat. <coughs> Go down to the store, walk down to the store, and get food. Something like that. I was young. Now, you can get food anytime you want. You can have food delivered to you at 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And you're not moving around like we used to. If we want to talk to our friends, we had to leave the house. I mean, we might be able to get them on the phone. That's if nobody else in the house was using the phone at the time. Mm -hmm. Or even if somebody was expecting an important phone call. Um, we would have to walk next door, walk down the street, or go to our friend's house. If we wanted to play basketball, we went outside and played basketball. We didn't get on a video game and play basketball or football. Can be an airbag on the I'm sorry? Can be an airbag on the And we had to memorize phone numbers. It's hard now. So in other words, people are spending a lot more time sitting on their sofa watching 900 channels on the TV while they have a computer or an iPad on their lap with their phone right next to them, mm -hmm. ordering food. So what that means is, now we're seeing people in their 30s or even 20s and sometimes even in their teen years developing this developing because of their lifestyle habits. They're developing this. That's why we can't call this adult onset anymore. That's why we had to change the names. Now it's type one and type two. Hmm. So, how do you get an over the road truck driver to change his lifestyle? Because you'll notice here, 
the treatments for type 2, the first thing we do is we change the lifestyle. Because if we do that, we can actually stop it. We can reverse it. Or we can avoid it altogether if they're at that stage where they're pre-diabetic, almost at that point where we can call them a diabetic. We can actually reverse it. All you have to do is change their lifestyle. But how do you get that over-the-road truck driver to change his lifestyle? Because he'll say, I'm on the road eight or ten hours a day. And the only place to stop to eat are those fast food places on the way. It's fast, it's cheap, it's easy. And it's delicious. Uh, okay, they'll say, can you just give me a pill? Yeah. Well, eventually, we're going to have to switch to insulin. It's coming. You're on that pill long enough. Because the next part of the treatment is oral medication that violates insulin. Now, why the big deal? Who cares? Most of the time, when people think of diabetic patients, they think of somebody who has to check their blood sugar, has to stay away from sweets, uh, maybe take a pill, maybe take insulin even. But here's the real concern with diabetes. These complications that I've listed here. The first one's called diabetic neuropathy. The nerves die. So they lose feeling. Tips of their toes first, bottom of their foot. What happens if you're walking in bare feet and you cut your foot on a piece of glass? How do you walk afterwards? What is that? Sort of like this? Yeah. Oh, your arms flailing around. Oh, is that how they walk in general? That's how you walk. Oh, please. I don't know about my dick. Yes, it's exactly how you walk. Mm -hmm. or when how do you walk if you didn't have feeling in the bottom of your foot? You just cut your foot on a piece of glass. On your tippy toe? Regular? You say if you didn't have no feeling. You didn't have no feeling. Oh, yeah, I'm a little Oh, it'll keep going in. So, is that going to increase or decrease the likelihood of infection? It very much increase. Increase. Is it going to decrease or increase the likelihood that it's going to clot? Increase. No, that's going to clot. Decrease. decrease. So it's going to keep bleeding. It's going to stay open. But it's definitely going to get infected. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's on the foot. This is bad. This is why, this is why diabetic patients can't cut their own toenails. What? Diabetic really patients can't cut their own toes. Oh, because they can't feel when they're going too low? Yeah, they cut right through skin and not even know it. Wow. Diabetic patients can't cut their own toenails. How do, how do you want to live like that, having to rely on somebody just to cut your toenails? You can't do it. You can't be independent enough to do that. But wait, because there's more. Diabetic nephropathy, the kidneys fail. Somewhere around 60 to 80 percent of all people in this country who are on dialysis right now, right at this moment, are there because of diabetes. Which means if you go to a dialysis center, you pick up 10 charts, six to eight of them are there because of diabetes. And 75 percent or more of the people in the United States who have diabetes have type 2, which means they could have prevented it, they could have reversed it, they could have stopped it, but they didn't. Now, what does that mean to be on dialysis? Going to the dialysis center. How many times a week does a person go to dialysis? Yeah, twice a week. You constantly like twice or three. Two to three times a week. Hmm. And what do they do after dialysis? What's, what do they do for the rest of the day? Take a nap. They sleep. That's their that's their whole day gone. Three days a week. Oh, yeah. Going to dialysis and then sleep. Hmm. And when a person is on dialysis because of chronic renal failure, what are they waiting for? A kidney transplant. A new kidney or nah. death. Those are the options. But wait, there's more. Diabetic retinopathy. They go blind. Diabetic patients go blind. This is why they have to go to an eye doctor at least once a year. Have their vision checked. So... They're clearly not going by themselves to dialysis because they can't see. Well, they're wiped out anyway, so they can't just drive themselves. So somebody else has to drive them to dialysis three times a week and drive them home. I don't care how many friends you have on Facebook. How many of those people are actually going to drive you to dialysis three days a week? So now you have to rely on strangers. Oh, and 75% of the people who were there did it to themselves. They didn't listen. Atherosclerosis is next. The hardening of the arteries. Hardening of the arteries specifically as a result of like cholesterol buildup, cholesterol plaques. Why is that bad? Well, because if the arteries lose that elasticity, 
control. Then the heart has to work harder. If the heart has to work harder, what happens to the heart? It gets bigger. It gets bigger, and then it fails. Also, now blood isn't flowing to all the places where it needs to flow. Which means the immune system doesn't get to where it needs to go. Remember that infection we had on our foot earlier? The bottom of our foot? That's not going to heal. Because there's less blood flow there and less immune response there. So poor wound healing and in fact chronic infections. And then it won't get the tissues at all, which means what happens to the tissues? Die. They die. What do we do with dead tissue? We cut it off because what loves dead tissue? Bacteria. Bacteria. So it's going to get infected. So we have to cut it off. That's why we cut off their toes. That's why we cut off part of their foot. That's why we cut off their whole foot. That's why we do the below the knee amputation. Is it more common on the feet because of you can't really see if you stepped on something and then... Um, well, more, then more of it is about the blood flow of the extremities. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, we're cutting their feet off. We're cutting their legs off. So now they're getting wheeled in to dialysis three days a week because they can't walk in. They can't see well. We cut their legs off. And 75% of the people who are there, 75% of the people with, di with diabetes have type 2. So they could have prevented all that. And if they're going to the dialysis three days a week, what are they doing the other days? Doctor, <coughs> Doctor visits. They got to go to the nephrologist, they got to go to the cardiologist, they got to go to the eye doctor, they got to go to the foot doctor. Oh Their whole life revolves around going to doctors. You're scaring me. Well, that's what it's supposed to do. Yeah. People have this idea that diabetes is about sticking your finger, checking your blood sugar, maybe you taking insulin, might be taking a pill, got to eat less sweets. No, it's bloody scary. People should be terrified of diabetes. But they're not. Horrible way to live. Yeah, that's bad. It is a horrible way to live. It's a horrible way. It's long, it's dry out, it's horrible. Just people will say, oh, you just choose burger because you're going to die of something. Yeah, but you're not dying. This isn't dying. This isn't killing you. This is breaking you apart. Mm -hmm. And it's going to cause you to have a miserable life. Not one cheeseburger, but the cheeseburger after the cheeseburger after the cheeseburger after sitting on the couch after doing nothing. All of that adds up. It does. It takes its toll. Now you got to rely on other people to help you just so you can live a miserable life. And we're not even done yet. Look at the next thing on the list. Yeah. Impotence. Do you know what impotence is? No. Erectile dysfunction. Oh, no. No one wants that. He doesn't want that. She doesn't want her man to have that. But this is what happens. I'm sorry? Okay. I say, you know when things go erectile. Erectile. Erectile dysfunction, that's to do with the penis. Um, I said, well, you know what things go rectile. 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 What did you just say? I said erectile. Erectile. And it said it causes to what? Dysfunction. An erection does not occur. No, I didn't say nothing about erection. I am. Oh, that's what you said. That's what I'm saying. This is. Oh. Yes. This is bad. Oh. This is bad for him, this is bad for his wife, girlfriend. I thought you were saying like, it was bad for her, like she did it too. No. Okay. So, people need to be afraid of diabetes. And if you have people in your family who have diabetes, you should be afraid because you're at a much higher risk. You should be watching every single thing you put in your mouth. You should be watching how much time you're sitting watching the TV or on the computer or on Facebook or sleeping? How did um, <clears throat> drinking alcohol affect diabetes? We talked about machinery, right? Mm -hmm. The more you use machinery, the more, the more it's going to break down. Mm -hmm. So if I'm somebody who eats a small amount of sugar products every day, like a small amount of carbohydrates, mm -hmm. I'm not using that machinery a lot. A little less than normal. If I'm a normal person who eats a normal amount of sugar every day, I'm using it about as much as I should, using that machinery. If I'm somebody who's eating all kind of carbohydrates, all kind of sugars, then I'm overusing that machinery. That day, 
the next day, to the next day, the next day. The thing about people who drink a lot, the alcohol, alcohol has a lot of sugar, a lot of carbohydrates in it. So if they're drinking a lot, it's like eating a dozen donuts every day. And not the mini donuts, the full-sized donuts. Because mini donuts, as we all know, don't count at all. So, yeah, if a person is already having problems with their machinery, the more they drink, the more they're going to break it down. Worse it gets. What? I didn't hear Twix bars. Um, actually, tests have been shown. They've actually done scientific experiments with Twix bars. And the thing that they found out is mind your own business. Okay, uh. all all right? Because so get off the Twix bars. So they're referring to your body. It's totally about your body. So. While she's pregnant. Just so it didn't have, she didn't have diabetes before pregnancy. Then she got pregnant. During the pregnancy, she has diabetes. And then once she delivers the baby, the diabetes resolves. It goes away. Oh, that was not This is bad news. This means that she is really likely to have diabetes in the future. Huh. If she doesn't change her lifestyle, she's going to end up with type 2 diabetes. Now, think about this for a moment. What do we, the patients who have diabetes, what does their blood sugar look like? High or low? High. High. And what is sugar used for? What is that glucose used for? Energy. Energy. To make what? Energy. It is energy. Energy, oh, ATP right. is energy. Um, What's the other thing that we make? Protein. Proteins. And we use those proteins for building things, right? Of course we do. That baby that's growing in the uterus, is that being built? Yes. Of course it is. So what happens if mom has really high blood sugar and that baby gets a whole lot of that blood sugar? He's going to be built. He's going to be built already. Because if we have, if he has more sugar, he's going to have more energy to do more growing. So how's he going to be in that uterus? He's going to be a big baby. He's going to be a bowling ball baby. Oh, wow. And that's not good. Because mm -hmm. how do we get bowling ball babies out? Man, C section is broken. Cesarean yeah. delivery. Is that what we want to do? No, no. 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 That is bad news. Dang. So we do not want big babies growing in the belly. Take them back. Take them back. No. Because the baby's not diagnosed with anything yet. Could it conceivably increase the chance of the child having one of the diabetes? Yes. Ever. Yes. Mm. Well, type 1 at birth, or increased risk later on type 2. But uh, if mom is not diabetic before she's pregnant, diagnosed as a diabetic while she's pregnant, and then it doesn't resolve after delivery, then it's no longer gestational diabetes. That's just type 2. Mm. Wow. She's got the DNA. So what if she has type 2 before she's pregnant? Then, then she has type 2, type 2, type 2. There's already a, a risk that the baby's going to be alive. Yes! So what do they automatically know that they want to be a C-section? We automatically prepare for it. Mm. We automatically assume. But we also want to make sure the mom's getting the right treatment. So that's considered a risk. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime 